Okay, so we, we're going to do an example now to do with linear programming, but we're going to look at a sensitivity analysis of the range of optimalities. So the range of optimalities is a form of sensitivity analysis, particularly it's the form where we look at the range that the coefficients of the decision variables can be in the objective function where we will still get the optimal solution that we solve for. So let's just say that in a slightly different way. The range of optimality gives us the ranges of the coefficients of the decision variables in our objective function and the ranges so that we still get the same optimal solution out. In other words, we don't have to restart our problem and resolve it. So to go through this process and to just quickly discuss it one more time, we are bringing back the solution to this. So technically they already told us the solution, they said it's at 12 and 15, and we could work out the range of optimality just from that, but I just want to explain it a little bit further. So remember we go ahead and solve this, to solve this you would plot the constraints, you'll scratch out, you know, where it's not feasible, you would find those corner points, you would put the corner points into the objective function, and figure out which one is the max in this case, because there's max there, and that is C. There is another way that you could have approached this, and that is you plot this line, and then you slowly push it across your page, basically. And the idea behind that is, and it connects to how the optimal solution actually works, and that where the optimal solution is, the objective function is tangent to the feasible region. So when you're looking, finding the optimal solution, the optimal solution is where the objective function is tangent to the feasible region. So if we go ahead and plot this objective function, you know, okay, I haven't got the gradient 100% accurate, but you get the idea. Pretend like that line there is the objective function equation and then we push it through, it'll be tangent at point A, which makes sense, minimization is zero, and then we continue on, you know, continue on, continue on, continue on. You'll notice at B, it is not tangent, it is crossing here, it's going all the way through the feasible region kind of situation, so obviously that one is not, it's not tangent at. You can do the same for D, it's not going to be there, but if you move on, you'll see that C, it is tangent, it's touching once in that kind of situation. And that's an important aspect of the whole concept of the situation of the convex sets and you have your optimal solution occurring at the extreme point what we call the corner points and the range of optimality is has to do with again these coefficients so we're going to be like okay how can we change them and the idea is that tangent aspect so at the optimal solution the objective function is tangent now we think about okay these coefficients are changed, if we change them, we change the gradient and the y-intercept of the objective function equation. So it will change the gradient, which means it will go either like that, or, you know, like that kind of a situation. So we have to look at what is going to maintain the vitally important point of it being tangent. And that comes from the constraints that make up the corner point which is the optimal solution because if we go like this and we move this gradient like that you notice at a certain point it's no longer going to be tangent it's going to be inside the feasible region there and obviously that makes this point no longer the optimal solution so the gradient of the objective function line is constrained by the constraints here so we have obviously it's whichever constraints are making that optimal solutions corner point but we have a case of the gradient can only be up to this point and the gradient can only be you know at that point so it's everything in between these two and that's what we look at when you look at the range of optimality so we look at the gradients of those two constraints because that is going to keep it so that it is sitting there at that corner point tangent at that corner point anything more or less kind of a situation it will no longer be tangent so that's what we're looking at there so that's why we need, you know, constraint one and constraint two's gradients. So what we're going to do here is we're actually first going to write all these lines in terms of like why the subject of the formula kind of situation, because I feel it just helps you make more sense. So once again, I'm going to follow the approach of not actually using x1 and x2, 
because I think you're more familiar with x and y. So we have the objective function that is 25x plus 30y. We have our constraint 1, that's 2x, it should be 20x. Yes, it should be 20x um, plus 30y less than equal to 690. That should be 20. And then we have 5x plus 4y less than equal to 120. And then we have x and y greater than equal to 0. We don't actually care about those because we're only interested in where that, you know, that's the optimal solution. Optimal solution is made where those two cross. So those two are the ones that are constraining that objective function's gradients. Okay, so then we just go ahead and make y the subject of the formula for both of them. So if we do that, we have, you know, we can first divide through by 10. So we have 2x plus 3y less than equal to 69. Then we have 3y less than equal to minus 2x plus 69. So y is less than equal to minus 2 upon 3x plus 23. So here we now automatically have the gradient of constraint 1, and we can do the same for constraint 2. So we have 4y less than equal to 120. Well, let's actually do this more accurately. Minus 5x plus 120. And then y is less than equal to minus 5 upon 4x plus 120 divided by 4 gives us 30. Okay, so we have the gradient for that as well. And the whole idea behind this process is when we're looking at this and we're looking at, you know, this objective function, we are going to be investigating these coefficients separately. So to make our lives a little bit easier, let's actually write these coefficients as, for a second as variables themselves. So we can rewrite this as uh, some function of x and y is equal to ax plus by. And then we can write, make it so that y is the subject of the formula as well. So then we have, you know, the case of by is equal to minus ax plus fxy. That would actually be a constant because it would be like the optimal solution. So in this case, when we did solve this, it did have a value and we could, you know, utilize that value, but we don't even care about that. So let's just leave it as that. Then we're going to have y is minus a upon bx plus, you know, that part there. Again, we don't, we're not going to really care about this part here because we're only going to investigate like the broader sense of these, of constraining these coefficients of x1 and x2. So we're going to investigate, you know, just this, the gradient here and this gradient is going to be constrained by these gradients and when we investigate it we're obviously going to have a situation of the gradients is going to be constrained by them so we have that minus a b of the objective functions gradient and it must be so you have minus 2 upon 3 and you have minus 5 upon 4 so it must be less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3 and greater than or equal to minus 5 upon 4. So that's just, you know, just standard looking at your gradients. It will be in between those two of them. So it will be minus 2 upon 3 is bigger than minus 5 upon 4. So you have the case of it must be less than minus 2 upon 3 and greater than minus 5 upon 4. So that's just giving us a range that the gradient could, you know, be tweaked in. And again, it comes down to it needs to be constrained by that for it to be tangent. So we're investigating the gradient kind of situation. Obviously, if the gradient changes, you know, your y-intercept is changing. Okay. Then we have to, well, what we have to do is we do have a range for that. But what we're going to do now for our range optimality is we investigate how much we can change one of those coefficients while the others stay the same. So the only thing that's going to change is either going to be our a or our b. So the A is connected to 25, and the B is connected to 30. So when we talk about uh, what is the range of optimality for the X1 kind of situation, we are looking for that A factor, the way that we wrote it out here. And if we're looking for, you know, X2, we're looking for that B. So if we're looking for, you know, for X1, we will put B in. So we're going to set X2s into here. 
So in this case, we'll have minus 5 upon 4 less than or equal to minus a. We'll put that 30 in there, and then we're going to have that minus 2 upon 3. And then we're going to solve for just a. So when you go ahead and do the, all this working out, there's a few ways you can do it. I'm going to do it separately. I'm just going to do it the slightly longer way because obviously this is an example. So I'm going to look at this side, and then I'm going to look at that side. So I'm just going to break them up for a second here. Minus a 30, and then minus a 30 less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3. Take the 30 across, so we have minus 5 upon 4 times 30 less than or equal to minus a. Then we're going to multiply through by that minus sign. And if we do that, we're going to get 5 upon 4, 30, because minus and a minus is a positive. The sign changes, and then the a. And now let's actually just do that working out of the math. So it is 5 times 30 divided by 4. And that gives us 37.5. So we're going to have a must be less than or equal to 37.5. And now I'm just going to heads up here of a way that you can check to make sure that your working out here is accurate. Check that your 25 over here fits under this condition. Because remember the range should include the value that you have there. It, the, that was used for our solution. So if it said a is greater than or equal to 37.5, you've made a mistake and you need to go back and correct it because obviously 25 is not greater than 37.5. So there is a way to check that you're working out here is correct by just thinking logically about the coefficients that are happening over there. Okay, so let's do the next side. So we have that minus a less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3 times 30. Multiply through by that minus 1, which means the sign changes, and we get 2 upon 3, 30. So let's go ahead and work that out. So it's 2 times 30 divided by 3 gives us 20. So a must be greater than or equal to 20. So now we have a range for that variable a. It must be, you know, greater than or equal to 20, less than or equal to 37.5, or we can write it in a different way of 20, which is a little bit more accurate way to represent this. It's 37.5. Generally, that's, you know, the preferred way. So we have a range the coefficient of x1 can be that we still have the optimal solution at 12 and 15. If it becomes 19, we can no longer use the solution and we have to go ahead and resolve our entire problem. And the same for if it's 38, same process. But if it's 21, we're still going to get that optimal solution of 12 and 15 coming out. So we don't have to go ahead and resolve it and that is obviously what makes the range of optimality such a useful feature. But another thing to remember is when you interpret this, that is if that 30 remains the same. So this is like the broadest idea of just this coefficient kind of situation. So just bear that in mind, it's when that 30 stays the same, then that can have a range of moving. And now we can do the exact same thing for finding the range of optimality for the coefficient of x2. So it's still going to be this part here, but now the difference is we are going to set 25 into this formula and solve for b. So we have that minus 5 upon 4, less than or equal to, and a is going to be 25, and that's going to be b, and that minus 2 upon 3. Okay, so we're going to take that, and we're going to take that there. Again, I'm doing it the long way. You can do it whatever way you want to do the math. And that's minus 25b, and that's minus 25b, less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3. I'm going to multiply through by b. We know that b is technically positive at the moment, that's why we're pretty chill with it. Or we can, you know, just do the whole flipping um, the fractions. I'm going to do it again the long way because it just makes more sense with explaining it. So we have, you know, that occurring there. And we have the 25 less than or equal to minus 2.3 be occurring here. Again, so let's work with this one here. We make B the subject of the formula, which means we're going to say B. We have that minus 25. It's going to be multiplied by 4 and divided by 5. We still have that minus B kind of occurring. Then we will multiply through by that minus B, which changes the sign to get, you know, that. 
25 times by 4 divided by 5. 25 divided by 5 is your 5. 5 times by 4 gives you 20. So B must be greater than or equal to 20. Again, we can check this. So we can actually go ahead and check that this is actually fitting in with this coefficient. So we haven't made any mistakes over here. Well, we could still make mistakes. But we haven't made any glaringly obvious mistakes. So B greater than or equal to 20. Yes, B here is 30, so that actually does work. And then you can move on and do the other side. And we are going to, you know, have that minus 25 less than or equal to, well, let's actually do this, 3 divided by 2 less than or equal to minus B. So I multiply through by 3 divided by 2. And then we have multiplied through by minus 1. So we have 25, 3 upon 2 greater than or equal to b. Remember, it flips signs because of that minus. And now we can do the working out here. So we have 25 times by 3 divided by 2, and that's going to give us 37.5. So b must be less than 37.5. And once again, we can just check, you know, to make sure we haven't made this a glaringly obvious mistake. So now we have a range. We have that b must be greater than 20 and less than or equal to 37.5. So we have the range of optimality for the coefficient of x2 as 20 and 37.5. And once again, that means that if, you know, this stays at 25, we can change the coefficient here anywhere between 20 and 37.5 and still maintain the optimal solution of 12 and 15. So we don't have to resolve our problem. Obviously, if you change both, there is going to be an issue kind of situation. So this is just giving you like the broad strokes kind of ideas of how much the things can change.